And we are live. Hello, guys, and welcome to Jason Hebert Live. We have another missing persons case for you. And this one involves, actually, it's a missing persons case, but this one involves six teenage boys missing from Pickering, Ontario, Canada. So this case is nearly 25 years old. Many of you have probably heard of it. As you know, on this channel, sometimes we it's usually a missing persons case. Sometimes it's a different kind of unsolved crime. But either way, the goal of this channel is to help spread awareness, get stories out there, and help bring closure to families that need it. Typically, we interview the family members of the subject of the case. Tonight, we'll be uh, talking to a private investigator that's on the case. So tonight will be a little different than most shows, but we're always interviewing someone who is uh, highly vested in whatever case we're talking about. So the difference with our show compared to many others is you get the story directly from the horse's mouth typically versus hearing someone like me that just kind of reads the story and then repeats it to you in my own words. Instead, we try to go directly to someone involved with it and you can ask questions. So in a case like this, you might've had a question for 20 years that you're saying, geez, I never can get this question answered. Well, with our show, you can, it is interactive. You have the chat there. You can ask the questions directly. We can't always get to absolutely every question, of course, because sometimes there are hundreds of people in the chat. Um, even tonight, we already have 60 people. We're just getting started. So I anticipate there'll be a good amount. But I promise you, we'll get to every question that we can and get get them answered. So, Or maybe it's a brand new case that you just found about two minutes ago and you're getting flooded with questions. Either way, you'll be able to get them answered. So hello to everyone in the chat. Like I said, we got about 65 people in here, so more than I'll be able to name. But we got some of our longtime members that are here for almost every show. Annie, Pam, Angie, Mary. Uh, Luis, hey Luis, haven't seen you in a bit. Shiva, Chris Marie, and you know Nick. What's up, Nick Graziano? Check him out, guys. He also is a true crime YouTuber. He does a great job on his channel, so I recommend you guys check him out. And he also has some footage of our channel in his. He's, he's referenced it in some of his videos, so check him out. I always support the newer guys and, and gals that are coming up and trying to make a difference that may not have the reach that uh, every that someone else does. Try to help them out and help them grow, but. Speaking of having other um, absolutely amazing people that we're involved with, I'd like to introduce tonight's co-host, the lovely Denise McGarity. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us again, Denise. Absolutely. My pleasure. You guys probably know Denise well. You've done probably, what, a good seven or eight co-hostings by this Probably. Absolutely, yes. So she always does a great job. She was particularly important tonight because... Um, Although our guest, you know, is similar, an investigator on the case. Denise uh, knows quite a bit about this case. She's been following it for about a year or so, would you say, Denise? Yeah, about a year. Before I looked into it, but it, about a year I started really looking into this. So, um, and have spoken to the family on this case. All right. Uh, we got about 20 people saying, hi, Denise. Hi, Denise. Hi, Denise. Trying to get them all on screen. Yeah. <laughs> I see them. Kubi says, hi, Home Slice. She's trying to be a little, <laughs> she, always trying to show off that Kubi, trying to be different. Love Kubi. <laughs> uh, laughing Ox says, generic greeting. <laughs> I'm generic greeting. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, so we're in like the low 90s. We're getting to a, about 100 uh, people. So that, that's a good start. looks like we got some interest in this case. So thank you so much, guys, for your interest in, in joining us. And myself, Denise, and our guest tonight, who is Bruce Ricketts, a private investigator on the case, promise to do our very best for you and answer every question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of the... Oh, we just hit 100 people. All right, guys. I'm, I'm going to hit the very basics of the case. As you guys know, I try to give you a little bit of an idea of what the heck we're talking about before we bring the guest on. But I try not to say too much because a lot of it's going to be repeated by them and they're going to say it a heck of a lot better than me. So it's kind of pointless for me to give you guys stuff that's just going to be said five minutes later, much better anyway. So I'm going to give you guys the very, very basics. So this is from mysteriesofcanada.com, which is a website I actually just found out was actually started by our guest tonight. I didn't even know that when I picked the website. So that shows you how much he knows about it. I randomly picked his site as the one that was going to be most useful. So this guy knows his stuff, Mr. Ricketts. And uh, so let me just read a couple of paragraphs of that, and then we will bring Bruce on. On the late evening of March 17th, 1995, after a spring break party, which included copious amounts of alcohol, six teenage boys from Pickering, Ontario, left the party. <clears throat> that was the last time they were ever seen. 
Witnesses and evidence suggest the boys went down to the beach looking for adventure. And once there, they may have stolen a four meter imitation Boston Whaler motorboat and a three wheeled paddle boat from separate marinas on Frenchman's Bay. That being said, I want to make this point very clear. We say this in every show because it's always relevant. Um, anything that we say tonight, there are no hard accusations made about anybody, whether it be the six boys, a suspect, um, what, you know, whether it's myself, Bruce, Denise, if anybody says anything, everything is alleged. There are no hard accusations made. It's all just people trying to piece together and figure, figure out puzzle pieces of what's going on. Um, once there, it's believed they headed out for a joyride on the cold, icy waters of the lake without life jackets. Before they left at around 12.50 a.m. on Friday, the boys told a friend they were going to, quote, goof around on a boat. The boys were all students and friends at a local high school. They included Jay Boyle, Michael Cummins, Daniel Higgins, and Chad Smith, Robbie Rumbolt, and Jamie uh, Lefabre, I believe is that's how that's said. Um, let me just show you guys a quick screenshot. I'm going to be showing pictures throughout the interview, but let me just real quick show you guys here. So this is Jay Boyle, Robbie Rumbold, and I know they aren't the biggest pictures. We'll have some better ones in just a moment, but just so you guys get an idea, Jamie Lafarbe. Think I'm saying that right? Is it Lafarbe, Denise? I, I think so, yes. Okay. Michael Cummins, Chad Smith, and Danny Hickens. The only evidence of the boys' fate included at 1.48 a.m., a surveillance camera caught three of the boys, Michael, Jamie, and Robbie, entering East Shore Marina somewhere between 2.30 and 3 a.m. Some local residents heard the sound of a motorboat out on the lake. And finally, the next morning, two boats were reported stolen from two marinas. The police believe the boats capsized and hypothermia gripped the boys within minutes. The boys were first reported missing by worried girlfriends on Friday. The police did not treat their concerns seriously until Saturday afternoon when they connected the boys to the missing boats. And here is the marina here in the harbor. Can you see that, Denise? Is that? I can, yes. Okay. Yes. I'm making sure. We'll get a couple more paragraphs in, then we'll bring on Bruce. <laughs> By 2 p.m. Saturday, 36 hours after the boys were last seen, a massive search was underway. Durham police were joined by the Toronto Police Marine Unit, the Coast Guard, Hercules C-130 aircraft and a helicopter from the Air Sea Rescue Unit at Canadian Forces Base Trenton. They found nothing. Thousands of volunteers from across southern Ontario then joined the hunt. But no bodies, no boats, no pieces of clothing. The only item found on the lake was a gas can belonging to the Boston Whaler. And we do have a picture of that, correct, Denise? Yeah, I'm not sure if that is the exact gas can, okay. but I, I believe it was very similar. So we have a picture of a similar gas can and a similar boat to the Boston Whaler. Exactly, boat. yes. To show the size of what that boat looked like. Okay, yeah, because six boys on that probably would have been rocking. and yes. It's a very small boat. Yeah, for sure. Especially for six drunk boys there to goof off. I'm sure they're jumping around and probably knowing boys, teenage boys, probably wrestling. And, of course, that's all, you know, guessing. I don't know, but, you know. You know how drunk boys can get. Drunk, I know drunk how people drunk boys in general, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Particularly boys. Uh, what happened to the boys? Why was no personal evidence of their fate ever found? Was there some sort of pact between the boys? Was there foul play? Did the boys actually die? Or was there an elaborate plot to just disappear? These questions and many more have never been answered in the last, it says 14 years, but this was 95, right? So we're talking 25 years at this point. Twenty six. Correct, years. yes. And what of the location? The East Shore Marina is adjacent to the Pickering Nuclear Facility. To get into Lake Ontario from Frenchman's Bay, the boys would have to literally pass by the plant. I don't know why that's super relevant. Maybe Bruce can get into that. But um, uh, the Lost Boys of Pickering is truly a mystery of Canada. And it says thanks to Ruben Ben Mergue for bringing the story to my attention. Uh, this was written by, this was not Bruce, right? Does it say? I don't think it has the author name. All right, guys. Either way, uh, I think, is this the comment? Yeah, no, that's the comment name. Okay. All right, guys. So, again, that's from mysteriesofcanada.com. Full credit to them, and thank you so much for a great job on that excellent article. And, okay, we are going to bring on tonight's guest. I don't want to make him wait too, too long for our highly esteemed guest, Mr. Ricketts. Sir, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We do appreciate you coming on and helping us hopefully uh, bring some kind of answers and finally solve this mystery. 
Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen tonight. <laughs> one well, one thing for you, the uh, the uh, Jamie uh, is Jamie Lafave. 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 Okay, I apologize yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah. Good good French type name like Ebert. Hey, oh, hey! Oh my God! Hey, I'll tell you what—that's the correct way of saying it, and I'll definitely take that. Other than the other way it's pronounced often, which is Sherbert or Herbert. Herbert. <laughs> People say Herbert and then convert it to Sherbert. So I'll take. Uh, yeah, a bear is the correct way of saying it, and almost nobody knows that except some people in Canada and New Orleans. Uh, Louis, uh, yeah. Well, Louisiana in general, I should say. Okay. Everywhere the Frenchies went, right? You got it. <laughs> All right, so why, why don't you start? Um, as I had said, uh, you guys are you know experts in this case compared to me. So, do you want to start with giving us a little bit of a timeline? You know, take us into what we do know from that night. Um, you know, kind of fill in some of the blanks that uh, haven't been mentioned so far, and let's, let's go from there. Um, sure. Um, I think it, it, the, the evening isn't going to case. Uh, just getting involved with it. Um, so, um, since that point in time, and now I have probably, I don't know, 15, 1600 pages of information. I have uh, videos and photographs and everything else, uh, that I've been collecting over the years and sharing with, uh, with, uh, some of the families. That is actually a photograph right there. Are, are, are you, is that online? Yes, it is. Yeah, that, that is. is actually the gas tank. That is the gas tank. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that, that gas tank was found floating upside down um, near, near Wilson, New York, oh, which wow. uh, Wilson, New York is, is actually diametrically opposite or south of, uh, of Pickering. Um, the, the reason for the circles on it was that uh, that, uh, that, by the way, is the only piece of evidence that's ever been found. And it, it, it was described or ascribed by one of the uh, the the workers at the at the uh, at the marina, as being the gas can that was in that uh, Boston whaler, uh, the reason he recognized it is because number one um, circle there is actually a very very small dent, which you can barely see. Mm -hmm. But he said uh, he claimed that uh, that dent was what identified that can. Oh um, wow! Right here, yeah. Yeah. So you can. Wasn't much of a dent. Uh, you can see that the the can is actually uh, labeled in both French and English, which mm -hmm. meant it was probably from Canada. Um, the number two uh, uh, circle had to do with the uh, that's the inlet uh, or the outlet, I should say, for the uh, for the gasoline. That uses what they call a bayonet mount. Um, I don't know if you if you know what a bayonet mount is, but basically it. It snaps in place and then locks itself. And in order to be able to get that off, you have to be able to push it back in, turn it, and pull it back out again. Okay. Um, so it's, it's like a bayonet on a rifle. Um, the reason I, I pointed that one out is because the um, if this was found floating, uh, the, the what I started wondering was uh, why, how did it get disconnected from the boat? Right. Um, so... The fact that there is no um, bayonet on there or any other any other piece of material on there indicated that it must have been taken off um, at the time that the that was was lost. Um, the number three. Uh, so if you get on one a little bit. Uh, Oop. then oops. Oops, Sorry about that. Give me a second. Yeah. I flip it around. There you go. The number three uh, circle has to do with the gas cap. There was no gas cap on this one. And this is two weeks after the boat the the, the boat was lost, okay. and uh, this was found floating upside down, with no gas cap, and uh, in Lake Ontario, uh, which is not exactly the the, the, the smoothest of lakes. So I, I found it very odd that, uh, that in fact you know this this cam was found with with no gas cap, upside down, with no mm. water on the inside of it. Um, really, it was okay. very odd. It just opens up a whole bunch more questions, uh, and uh, you know, as an investigator, the one thing you want to do is ask a lot of questions. For sure. And then so hopefully you get, get a lot of answers. And what questions did that immediately open up for you? Why don't we go over a few of those? Are you asking me that? Yeah, since we're yeah okay. Well, it, it, it opened up three three questions. Uh, there, there's well, it's not quite the Boston Whaler. There's no uh, 
there's no uh, um, steering wheel on, on the one. It was a 25 horsepower engine at the back that was being handled that way. But Bruce, so, that's similar to size, correct? Yeah, four meters, four, about 14 feet. Okay. Um, Boston whalers are, uh, are uh, considered unsinkable because they're basically uh, fiberglass stuffed with, uh, with uh, styrofoam. So uh, you can cut them in half, uh, you can blow them with holes with, with, the, with a shotgun. They show this on their own website. Mm. And uh, these things just don't sink. They say that um, about Boston people too, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't get me started on Boston people. So. <laughs> um, being a Montreal Canadiens fan, I... Uh, Oh and, God! Uh, okay. All right. We, we All right. Thanks for joining us tonight. We will we'll, <laughs> we'll conclude the interview there, and thanks for showing. So, if you go back to the gas can again, uh, basically, basically, it, it opened up a whole series of questions. First, the first question, obviously, was how did they how did they actually recognize the can? Uh, didn't seem like much of a of a uh, of a dent to to make it stand out that much. The second thing is. Was the uh, was the gas can actually disconnected by the boys? If in fact uh, they they disconnected it, uh, uh, and then the third one was why after three or two weeks on, on Lake Ontario was this thing upside down with no gas cap and still floating? Um, so those are the questions that that popped up on on this one, and uh, they're I'm still waiting for them to be answered. Um, they're very difficult to answer because you're essentially asking them to to explain a negative. Um, so we'll see what happens on it. Anyway. Okay. So, so that, that's the, uh, to say that's the only piece of evidence, quote unquote, that was, that's been ascribed to, to the missing uh, boys. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, we go back to the, go back to the evening uh, of March 17th. The, um, the, the, uh, the fact that the boys went down to the marina, we found a lot of this since I wrote that first article back in 14 and then a number of other things I did back earlier than that. But um, um, one of the things that I, I found out, in fact, uh, the boys had actually gone down to the marina the night before. There was some, uh, there's some confusion that there was actually two boats stolen. One was the Boston Wheeler. The other one was a tricycle, actually, a three-wheeled uh, bicycle, water bicycle. Um, and in fact, that three-wheel water bicycle was actually taken the night before from a different marina. So on the night that the boys went this, boys went missing, there was only one boat that was that was lost at that point in time. Okay. Um, when the when the girls, uh, the girlfriends, uh, went down to the police to report that the boys had not come back from from the marina to the party. Like they said they would, um, the uh, the police basically uh, brushed them off. Let's put it that way, um, and said, uh, you know, boys will be boys type of thing. And if they're still missing in the morning, have the parents come down and, and we'll file a case. Um, the parents came down the following day. The case was filed, but the police still didn't do too much on it. it took them about. Uh, uh, 24 to 36 hours before they actually began the search. Um, and if you watch TV, you know, things like 24 and stuff like that, you'll know that the first 24 hours are the most important of the, of the thing. So um, there was uh, there was a Coast Guard, there was a Marine unit uh, from Toronto, there was the uh, there was the Royal Canadian Air Force with the C-130 uh, Hercules and the and a helicopter that were sent out. Um, and there was leads followed up on, leads given that weren't followed up on. Um, there was a lot of artifacts that were found along the, around the water uh, that were cataloged, but uh, not ascribed to, to any of the boys. There was, there was really nothing that was found. No parts of the boat, no boat at all. Um, no, no caps, no jackets, nothing. The police uh, spent 36 hours on the investigation, roughly, and at the end of that, that period of time, they essentially declared that the, the boys had gone missing onto the water. It had been a misadventure. Uh, they had uh, suffered hypothermia by falling out of the boat or jumping out of the boat or somehow getting into the water. Um, they went to the bottom of the lake 
and their bodies have never come back up. Um, the the Toronto uh, Marine Unit were the ones that uh, gave the information about about cold water, uh, essentially carrying the, carrying and keeping the bodies at the bottom of the lake. Um, I'm actually a cold water scuba diver myself, so I'm a commercial diver, but I have a, a cold water uh, rating also. And uh, I, I agree with them that the bodies can sink, um, but I could see maybe one or two of them sinking and staying, but I couldn't see all six of them staying down that length of time. Okay. You know, they were they were not heavily weighted, um, so uh, that uh, that opened up a whole series of more questions that actually have never been answered at this point in time. So. Throughout the investigation, we tried to figure out, you know, if if the boys did go missing, um, what in the evidence or the reports uh, could we pull out to give us an idea of what was going on and what may have happened at that point in time? Because you have to, if you can't find the evidence that the boys drowned on the lake, then you're going to have to look at something else and, and try to eliminate those and eliminate everything that you can in order to be able to go back to the to the original assertion. And I'm not saying in any way that the police are wrong on this, okay? Um, what I am saying is, is that um, if the police are unable to provide the evidence to corroborate their conclusion, then as far as I'm concerned, the conclusion is not a conclusion, okay? okay. And uh, that's that's the way I, I, I approach these things. Or at the very least, it's definitely not definitive. That's for sure. Well, yeah, there's nothing definitive in this thing at all. Absolutely yeah. nothing. Right. And the one thing that I always point out, and I pointed out to the families when I started working on this case, is that uh, is that uh, you know this is a this is not a foot race. This, this is a marathon. You know, it's going to take a long time. We're gonna we're gonna find information. It's going to be disproved. It's going to be lack of proof about it, uh, but we're going to keep pushing forward as much as we can on the case until so, such time as either we, we solve the case or we absolutely run out of, of anywhere to go with it. Um, absolutely. So if, if I can ask you, so I am uh, very behind compared to you guys on it. So I definitely want to make sure, Denise, I know you have a few questions. I just want to kind of ask one real quick, a very general one. From everything I could find from my my quick research on the case, um, it's that they were talking beforehand about, you know, goofing off on a boat or something along those lines, that they were seen there. There is the boat missing. So everything that I could find appears to be that they had a plan to kind of mess around on the boat. And as far as we know, they got there and at least started the plan. But you're saying you don't see six of them having sank. So knowing what we know, what, what conclusion would you say is most likely about what, what are we looking at here? Because we know that they got to the marina, uh, but you're saying you don't believe the six of them could have could have sunk. Uh, what, what do you think could have happened? What's what are the likely scenarios in your mind? Well, I, I, I don't speculate on these types of things. Um, I, I try and look for, for hard evidence, uh, or at least soft, soft evidence if I can. So I don't like to speculate, but but let me let me open a couple of things up. Okay. Um, the first thing is the um, the, the the video um, capture that went on at at the marina. There was two cameras on that night, um, and I've it took me three separate access requests to finally get the, the, the video sent to me. Uh, the, the first time that uh, I requested it, they said there was no video. Okay. Um, so uh, I had to go back at it, and it was the third request that I finally got a copy of the video. Um, when I ran the video, um, and by the way, we knew the video existed because the families were shown the video the, uh, the day after the boys went missing. So we knew that the video actually did exist. Uh, we didn't know what form it would be in. Uh, but anyway, I was, it was sent to me in, in an MP4 uh, form. Uh, and I went through, through the video um, all six hours of it. <laughs> okay. Just, just, just to see. Uh, and then I did the screen captures of it to, to determine uh, what I was looking at at that point in time. The first thing I had to do was I had to find out roughly where the cameras were being located. And that was difficult because that marina um, 
was quite large at one point in time. Um, the, pho the photograph you're looking at right now is actually a Google Earth picture that has been uh, regressed back to, I think, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Well, Google Earth has, 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 a, has a function called history. And uh, I think it's this one, I can't really see it from here, but I think it's 2014 or 2012. So I initially thought maybe I, I figured out where the, the cameras were. It turned out that we were wrong initially. And it turned out that the, the cameras are at a completely different location. Uh, one was uh, pointing towards the White House, which still exists, that gave us the idea where that was. And the other one was down in the, if you take a look at, if you lower your, uh, if you lower to the, uh, to the, yeah, okay, now go to the left. Keep going, keep going a little bit there. Yeah, that's roughly where the second camera was. Okay. Right about here? Yeah, that, and that, that was a movable camera, so that was swinging back and forth uh, okay. as we went. And that's where three of the, of the six boys were actually uh, noted on the, on the, on the film. Um, they were identified by the, by the families, um, as being down there. And that, uh, that camera angle indicated that the boys in fact were coming from the party had gone past the, the area nearby the, uh, the, the wharf itself into the area where the, the Boston whaler would have been kept. Okay. Okay. Now, Saying that, we saw only three of the boys. On the rest of the on the rest of the, the, the tape, both the the wide angles shot aimed towards going up uh, Liverpool Avenue, and also the, the the narrow one. The three boys, the other three boys, did not show up on those the camera. Now they okay. could have come around the back of the camera, for all we know, but at no point in time did they show up on on the camera itself. Um, so, so you know, from that you have to conclude that yes, they were in the area. They were in the area of the boat. Um, so yes, more than likely they they had taken the boat out. The problem you get into is you have to ask yourself and then the question of when they took the boat out, um, was there a reason why they, they they took the boat out? Was it? Well, that's the that's the movable camera actually. Okay. Um, can you zoom in on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, the, the, the large picture is actually the, the uh, movable camera. The other picture is, is, a, is a longer uh, longer focus one. You can see the White House at the end. So this is where you uh, pointed me to right in front of the, the wharf there. Yeah, th this is the one that's near the wharf. The other one is further up. Um, is there another uh, picture of the of the whole area. Um, yeah, this gets I'm stuck. I'm not sure if I right sent now. another one of the whole area. Um, I do have probably not what you're looking for. Something like this that covers the whole area. This. No, th no this is the one. This, this is one. That's the one. Okay. Yeah. So if you see the the red the red arrows. Yeah. That's that's the service area. Okay. okay. Um, so this is where the boys were seen. Okay. The the, the blue arrow further up uh, up where it says inset view mm -hmm. um, that's the small uh, image that's on the on the, the camera on the film. Oh, okay and it it points towards you can see a green arrow going up it's pointing towards the white house so the white house that shows up in the in the in the long view of the video the inset view of the other one so when we go through this thing we actually see vehicles coming into the into the um, into the uh, uh, area. And when you see them, they come in there. You can follow the, the sort of yellowish orange line. They come in at the top. They come along that, that long road and then they make a, uh, uh, they make a right hand turn. Okay. So they're coming down, down towards the bottom here. So they, they come in at the top. They make the, they make the left hand turn they go all the way down, make a right-hand turn, and then they park down in the area called the service area view. Okay. Okay. So the, the two cameras uh, were, and, and these are approximated. Obviously, we don't know exactly where they were. Right. The cameras, especially the service area one. 
it's very easy to find out basically where the, the top one was, the in, inset view camera was. But um, you can see that the that the service area view is very close to the boat launch. And the boat launch is where the, the Boston Whaler was being kept at that point in time. Right here, okay. Okay? Yep. So that gives you an idea of the, of the thing. Now, the, the party was actually further north than this. Um, it was uh, for this is uh, the, the street along here, uh, parallel to it is, is Liverpool Avenue. Is north up towards the White House up here? Yeah, but beyond that, uh, quite a distance up okay. is actually where the party was, was being held at that point. Was I was going to ask you to the, if they walked down there, how far did they walk? Because it was 39 degrees in 1995 there. Uh, I actually measured that at one point in time. I, I don't recall exactly. It's probably in the range of about uh, 300 yards, maybe. Okay. Uh, can't, can't say for sure, but uh, it's, it's in that range anyway. Mm -hmm. And don't forget they had, they had their artificial warmers going. Mm -hmm. they, they, they drunk a few artificial warmers. <laughs> right, right. So. Do, you, do you know how much, did anybody ever state how, I mean, no. how much the boys had drank that night? No, no. It's... Uh, it's very difficult to talk to the people who are actually at the party because a lot of them don't want to talk about it. Um, same with same with the families. Can't really mm -hmm. get a hold of all the families because one of the families moved away and no one knows where they are. And um, and it's tough to talk to the other families. Jay Boyle's family have, have been the ones that came forward fastest. Uh, they were actually the first ones that I that I contacted when I started looking into this case. So. So Jay Boyle's family is really the one that I've been working closely with mm -hmm. throughout this. He has four, four sisters. He must have driven them crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but uh, anyways, uh, they, uh, they're, they're, that's I, the family just, that I, I deal with. Just real quick, since we're kind of, we're on this subject right now. Susan Meyer asks, how do they know that they even took the well, there's no guarantee that they actually did take the boat. They, the correlation was that the boat was missing, was was reported missing the morning after the boys went went missing themselves. Um, there was apparently two people living on boats in that in the, in the marina who had uh, early in the morning had heard um, a motorboat leaving the marina and going out into the lake. Um, so there's only the, the um, you have to surmise that, in fact, a, a boat was taken and taken out under the, under the lake. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Louise Haraway says, could the boats have never been launched? Maybe the boats were never used. The gas can could have been thrown in the lake. If it was empty, the boat wouldn't have been of any use to them. But that wouldn't explain the fact that the boat went missing, of course. Right? No, and in fact, the gas can, uh, according to the, uh, to the marina staff, the, the gas can in on that boat um, had had uh, enough uh, had about three gallons or so of, of, of fuel had enough to go about 25 miles. Okay. Um, that, that's what they said at the point in time. The, the one miles, that went missing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So 25 miles if you if you draw draw a circle from from the marina takes you in one direction almost to the edge of, um, actually to the edge of, of Toronto. It takes you half, halfway across the lake, certainly onto the onto the American side of the lake. And then the other direction, it takes you quite a distance down the, uh, down the, uh, down the coast also on the, on the Canadian side. I should point out, by the way, that um, you asked the question uh, earlier, uh, Jason or made, made the comment, or asked the question about the, the nuclear facility. Right. Um, the reason why we investigated the nuclear facility, and by the way, we were, we were unable to get the answers we were looking for, um, or at least to get the answers to the questions that we were asking, was because of the security surrounding the, the, the nuclear plant. And that kind of makes sense. Um, the reason I took a look at that is because um, it's possible that, that with the amount of water that's being sucked into the nuclear plant, it's possible that things get sucked into it. So they have what's called trash oh, racks okay. there. Um, but if they get past the trash racks, they can go into the impeller uh, facilities and, and uh, cause gumming up of the, of the works and everything else. 
Um, so I asked the questions of the of the uh, of the hydro people, and uh, I was not able to get answers for for purposes of security, and that made sense to me. So it was it was kind of a uh, it was kind of a you know a hail mary type of for sure type yeah. Of <laughs> I mean, you're trying, you're trying everything at that point, right? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Laughing Hawk, I think you had said the temperature, Denise. Laughing Hawk says, is there a, temp a record uh, of the temperature of the water and the currents that day? From what I saw, and I have did some research through, um, you know, about the lake, the depth of the lake is about 101, 100, or sorry, 801 feet, if I'm correct, Bruce. And the temperature of the water on that day was roughly around it, it stated 39 degrees is that correct uh yeah 39 fahrenheit right yes yeah. fahrenheit sorry <laughs> sorry I, I, yeah. I don't live in fahrenheit anymore uh yeah, yeah probably be <laughs> we're weird area. we're weird like that over here yeah, we that's okay yeah. <laughs> uh, but you notice i said that the boat was 14 feet long <laughs> right uh, the uh, yeah, that 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 sounds just about right. Uh, clo okay. Close to the close to the freezing level, there was still ice on on the lake, in some areas. Um, uh, lake Ontario itself is a uh, is not a fast moving lake at the surface. Okay. Okay. But further down, it is it is quite fast moving. Okay, that um, was a question I was going to ask you: is the currents? Well, I wondered that too. It's interesting because yeah, the the. The people who live there, who work there, one one of the uh, the, the local um, fishermen uh, who's been working on that lake for you know since God made hair, um, said that if that boat had gone missing on the lake, it would have been found some someplace around Buffalo. Okay. That's that's what the currents were like. Based on the currents, okay. Yeah, based on the currents, it'd be found around Buffalo area. Um, by the way, we checked in Buffalo and there was no boat. Um, so, uh, the other thing is that, uh, the night that they went missing was actually flat calm. Okay. Okay. There was very little wind that night. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have enough on a wind, uh, current, if you want to call it that, or wind movement. And there wouldn't have been a lot of waves at, on, on that, but the current does move. And it obviously comes from Niagara area down through the lake at, and out, uh, the, the St. Lawrence area. Okay. Um, so that's the way he says it, it would end up somewhere around around Buffalo. Um, it, you know, if we come back to to the boat itself, let me let me let me give you a a scenario, okay? And the scenario in this particular case is that in fact the boat the boat did not sink. Um, that in fact, what happened was the boat ended up on the U.S. side. It was pulled from the water, uh, repainted, renumbered, sold, yeah, whatever. Okay. So then the question just became, well, what happened to the boys? And again, we're, we're coming down to uh, coming down to uh, the question of, you know, what happened to the boys? We just don't know. Well, but I mean, I guess it's a possibility. It capsizes, they drown and die. Someone finds a free boat, paints it, doesn't want to say anything because then they lose their free boat, maybe, you know? You know, you don't have to paint it. All you have to do is put a, put a U.S. number on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I, I'm not an expert, but you find a free boat, you and I, and I would guess if I find this free boat, I know I shouldn't be taking this thing. It's not mine, right? So I take it, do whatever I got to do, put a number on it, and now I get a free boat. Then I hear a bunch of kids died in relation to it. I'm probably going to shut up and say, oh, boy, I don't know what I got myself into here. Let me shut up and stay away from this story, right? I mean, that's right. a possibility. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, by the way, I can, can, can I ask you real quick before we move forward, just for my own sure. uh, understanding, 39 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, a few drunk teenagers, what's likely, if they do fall into that water, how long before they, they freeze and just completely, you know, lose consciousness? I mean, that's pretty dang cold, right? Yeah, it depends on an awful lot on, on on their constitution, what they were wearing at the point in time, and everything else. But I, I would say probably no more than sixty seconds. Okay. Before, so. before they, if they, they, that's not, they won't lose consciousness and everything else. But they, what they'll lose is they'll lose motor skills to right. be able to get back out of the boat. Which once that starts happening, you're pretty much gone, right? I mean, 
I would you don't have your wits about you and your motor skills to be able to pull your whole body weight back up, you're you're in trouble. Right. Right. Okay. So you get about 60 seconds tops, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not say, saying any of this happened. I'm just, you know. I wouldn't say tops. I'd say approximately 60 seconds. It might be more than that. Okay. Okay. Either way, it's not long. We're not talking 10, 15 minutes by any means, you know. Right. I think uh, I think I've just fallen in love with Kubi. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just her picture, or what she's saying, or what? No, what? Just a picture. <laughs> yeah. there you go. Well, she's uh, one of the main people on this channel, so hey, stick right, around. Right. You'll see plenty of her. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely, Bruce. Yes, you it's picked a good her. one. <laughs> um, the answer to her question, by is yes, yes and no. The the. Uh, the, uh, the boat is not necessarily easy to capsize. Um, it really depends. Now, the, the thing to understand is, is that although the six boys are there, they're not all novices to, to being in a boat. And in fact, two of the boys had a lot of experience in boats. Um, so if there was a lot of kibitzing going on, uh, chances are they would have put a stop to it. Um, so, um, but if it did capsize, um, <laughs> uh, if if it did capsize, uh, obviously it, it causes a problem. But you know, the first thing did all the boys go in the water at the same time? Okay, that's that's the other question. Right. If one of them one of them went in the water, could they have pulled the other one back out? Uh, if they did that, would they all lean over to one side of the boat and then the boat capsizes. Who, who knows? Um, exactly and, and, I mean, just just for the sake of thoroughness, did anyone ever look into? Is there any friction between any of these boys that a fight could have broken out, or someone could have tried to do something to the other one? Then it's bad for all of them. I mean, I mean, just kind of they try to think of anything here. Has that been looked into at all? If there were any, any there was between them? there was no uh, there was no evidence of that. They were all good friends. Okay. So, okay. Uh, and, and not to say that. Uh, you know, there couldn't have been a problem with a bit further out. But but let me throw you uh, let me throw you a little bone on, on one side of it, and let me let me give you a. Um, at that point in time, back in 1995, there was a drug trade going on back and forth between the United States and Canada, and the um, <laughs> there was there was a there was a a fair amount of drugs being taken back and forth by boat. Okay. okay? Um, now, I don't want to. I don't want to say that this actually happened, but let me tell you a little story. I have a cousin of mine who was involved in the drug trade in Cal in in Florida, between Florida and and the Bahamas. Um, I asked him at at one point in time what the secret to not being discovered was, and what he said was, I owned both ends. Of, the, of the, the distribution chain. What did that mean? He owned uh, the boat and the wharf that the boat left far from in the Bahamas. He also owned the boat and the wharf that the boat went to in Florida. Okay, so he owned both ends of the, of the distribution chain. So he was able to control the, the way information went back and the way the drugs went back and forth between the Bahamas and and uh, and uh, and uh, Florida, okay. In this case, now why is that important? Um, I said that the gas can was found in a place called Wilson, New York. Now, Wilson, New York has a has a uh, um, has a marina there, and that marina is the sister marina to the one in Pickering, Ontario, where the boat went missing. Okay. Okay. So the, the same owners of the, uh, the, the, the owners of the, the Pickering Marina and the Wilson, New York Marina are the same owners. Um, so that opened up a, a question in my mind as to whether or not there was, a, there was drugs involved in this thing. And um, that's, that's part of what, uh, what we're, we're investigating now. Um, there is a... Mm, there's another piece of that puzzle. I don't think I'll go into it because uh, it's it's kind of it could be slanderous. But uh, there there was a there was a, a teacher um, who knew the boys who was involved with the drug trade, 
back in 1995. Oh, wow. Um, so um, I won't tell you too much about that, but, but the bottom line is that uh, the, um, the whole idea of the, of the drug trade um, isn't taken off the table. And how that, how that manifests itself is, that, is it's this way. First of all, the, the amount of gas that was in that can uh, was underestimated. The boat actually made it all the way across to uh, to uh, Wilson, New York, where it was taken out of the water. The gas can was was removed at that point in time. Um, the boat was lost. The gas can was found. Um, that's another explanation, if you want to call it that, or or postulation, I should say, more than anything else on 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 the uh, on that particular thing. So. And, and you never know. There's also the issue of you know did the boys make it across to to the United States and and uh, and get, and disappear? Um, you know, I mentioned the, the 25 mile radius of the of the the gas uh, in the can. Um, there was a sighting of one of the boys down down in uh, in uh, uh, the Scarborough area, Scarborough down the beaches area of, of Toronto where he lived actually. And that was the day after they had gone disappeared. So it's possible that uh, the, the boys ended up down there. Um, if that was the case, then the gas can somehow made it across to to Wilson, New York. Uh, you know, kind of kind of counterintuitive, but uh, that's would you agree happened. though that that's? I mean, to me, that sounds. I mean, I, I would leave any scenario open, but six. I mean, it's hard enough for one per teenage teenager to go missing and disappear, no trace for twenty five years, but six people. I mean, I'd say that's even much more unlikely than six people going underwater, wouldn't you? I mean, six of them, and there's no trace that ever pops up of any of them. That seems a little unlikely, you know? Well, the thing is about with Canada and United States, and I know I've kind of talked a little bit about this with Bruce, uh -huh. there was not a lot of communication okay. at that time between the areas. Am I correct, Bruce? That was... In between the U.S. and Canada, you mean? Right. At that time with the searches and everything, it wasn't coinciding. Right. Nobody was looking on the United States side. Right. And as far as even um, age progression pictures of the boys, there is, in the United States, there's nothing. There's no missing persons flyers that went out in the United States. There has been nothing done in the U.S., at least um, they haven't been able to find right. throughout. You're, you're entirely right about that. Um, I should tell, say also that uh, there was a number of reports in the, in the files that I received from the police under access to information um, that indicated that, the, that reports of the boys being seen in certain parts of, of, of the United States, um, northern New York area, um, at a restaurant. Uh, they were identified with, uh, you know, uh, by clothing, by people who knew them. So, so there is, there are reports that indicate that maybe they made it across to the U.S. side. Now, maybe they didn't all make it across to the U.S. side. Yeah. Okay. You know, maybe some of them went in the water. Uh, maybe some of them um, continued on out. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't believe that that actually did occur okay mm -hmm. and and the reason i say that is because i've talked with the parents of the of some of the boys and they have a hard time believing that after 25 years their sons would never have contacted them at all mm -hmm. okay and in the case of jay boyle um he had a brand new daughter um, okay that's a cool you were saying that one of them had a yeah yeah so he he had a brand new daughter and you know he he missed everything about that that kid growing up, and would he would he have stayed away for any period of time? Even even drug deals have uh, have a uh, uh, you know length of time associated with them. So um, you know, chances are, twenty five years later, he wouldn't be charged with some sort of drug thing. So why would he why would he stay uh, disappeared? Well, I have trouble long. with that side of it, but but I, again, I can't put it aside. Mm -hmm. because I, I can't prove or disprove it either. Now, Bruce, there has not been any underwater searches, correct? No. No, it was uh, th that was a strange one. Um, 
I contacted a, uh, uh, a company in Belleville, Ontario, which is just a bit further west of here, east of here, um, Pickering. Um, they are a, uh, they're an underwater company, so a marine company. And they had received a contract from the, uh, from the Durham police to do a side, can, side scan sonar investigation of the area around the marina and out into the lake. Um, and that contract was actually canceled by the Durham police for no reason at all. So there was never any investigation done uh, using side scan sonar. Um, can, can I ask you real quick, because we've had a lot of talk and questions in the chat. I just want to make sure I don't lose track of it. Uh, and I have a picture too about uh, jeans, like reddish orange jeans or shorts being found. We get a picture. A lot of people talking about, I think one of the boy's mothers said that he was wearing it at a party or something. What's the story with these reddish orange jeans? Then I'm seeing someone here say, I knew of the few of the boys, says Frank and Beans. Remain, Frank and Beans. Remains were found with red jeans on in the Niagara region. Took years for them to compare DNA and sadly it was inconclusive. What's the story with these? Is this a... Is there a lot of info to this, these red, reddish orange jeans or shorts? Well, there's a lot of info. It's, there's, there's still a lot of questions around it. Um, the, the police and the, and the coroner think that they put it, put it to bed, but uh, um, not yet. Okay. Um, here, here's the story. In 1999, um, a pair of, there was two, two bodies found floating in the Niagara River near the, uh, the intake of the, uh, of the, uh, the uh, Ontario Hydro plant on the Niagara River. Um, the one one set of remains um, was wearing uh, was a pay, basically a pair of red jeans with a black belt, a wallet that was empty, and there was a, a long bone in them and a uh, multicolored sock. Um, they were taken into custody by the Niagara Regional Police. And it took me a long time to get a copy of the police report, heavily redacted, by the way. Um, but the police report said that uh, the, the jeans that were found were, in fact, uh, uh, red uh, denim jeans from Levi Strauss, size 32. Um, and uh, they were sent to the, to the uh, Hamilton uh, General Hospital for autopsy. Okay, for... Uh, Autopsy in that particular case is only one bone, but uh, I have not been able to get a copy of the autopsy yet. I'm still waiting for that. Um, but um, the thing was that uh, Jay Boyle himself, and we have a photograph of that someplace around. I uh, you have a photo of the jeans. I sent that to you. Yeah, well, there's, there's that, actually a photo a photo of uh, of Jay Boyle wearing uh, the night he disappeared, mm -hmm. sitting. On a uh, on a bench wearing a pair of red Levi jeans. Oh, yes. I yes. don't have that, do we? No, I did not give that to you because I wasn't sure if we could show it. So, oh, I see. Okay. Um, but I do have a copy of that. Um, but there is where he's sitting in a chair and he's wearing jeans that are very close to that. To yeah, his, mo his mother bought them for him. Mm -hmm. In fact, she she bought him two pair of jeans at the same time, one red and one green. Um. My understanding is back in 1995, um, red and green jeans were, were, were in fashion. Okay. Yes, they were. I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> I got to admit, in 1995, I was out west at that point. In time. So, uh, anyways, um, as I say, I, I went to, to to the point of trying to get copies of the of the. Uh, the uh, police report, and it was very heavily redacted. Um, there was there was never uh, any DNA done on on, on the long bone. Um, so uh, the Boyle family actually put together an online petition, got uh, I don't know fifty thousand signatures or some something like that, and uh, the, the the package was finally sent over to the Ontario coroner, um, and the Ontario coroner. Uh, did their investigation and ultimately, uh, making a long story short here, uh, really short, they they said that the the DNA that they recovered from the bone did not match the DNA of of Jay Boyle. Now, having said that, <laughs> again, the questions pop up. Uh, the first question that pops up 
was um, why is the report that I received from the from the uh, from the Niagara Police so heavily redacted? Uh, they initially claimed it was for privacy purposes. My question to them was, whose privacy? Mm. These are unidentified remains. Right. We don't know who they are. Um, are you protecting a bone? Um, so um, there was no answer to that question, by the way. Uh, then I asked them the second question was, why did you redact the name of the officer who filed the report? And there was never an answer to that one either. Mm. And then the third set of questions popped up. When I went to visit with the with the uh, with the coroner, with the sisters of, of Jay Boyle, this is after the, the bones have been sent over. Initially, they 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 said that um, there was no, they could not recover the DNA to be able to do the tests. Um, it took them quite a while after that, after being pushed a little bit, and said yes, we did find the DNA and didn't match, but. What popped up and during the meeting with the, with the Ontario coroner was my and my question to them was why did it take so long for the Niagara Police to send you the evidence box and the the answer in the minutes of the meeting was that uh, the evidence box had been lost or misplaced by the Niagara Regional Police because they went to, they did some some uh, some uh, renovations in their offices, and then when they finally found them, they sent them over to the to the to the Ontario coroner. So then I turned around and asked the police, "Would you mind sending me a copy of the of the continuity sheets, the ones the ones that uh, if you follow anything in, with with evidence, there's a, what they call continuity of evidence. So you have to you have to take any forensic evidence and be able to follow exactly who's been touched them, uh, where they've been located." Where they were being shipped, who shipped them, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there is no copy of a continuity form that they've been able to show me. Hmm. But then the worst part was when the Ontario coroner, the, the forensic uh, anthropologist there, described the, uh, the, um, the pants that she was sent. Um, she said, that it's not possible that these were read me by jeans from the 1990s. It's not possible. Not possible. That was what? that was that was her term. It took me a while to get to get a copy because they took notes. So did I. But I want I wanted their notes. And uh, in in the notes it says it says that right in the notes that uh, Dr. Grespier uh, said that uh, it's not possible that these are read me by jeans. She said there were orange pants. With a fire retardant on them. I mean, they could have um, faded being in the water all that time, right? I mean, that's well, what it looks like to me. You you got a photograph of the of the pants that you just those weren't faded. There. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they are faded a little bit. They're, a little, they're little bit. They're a little I mean, not too bit. Spots, but certainly not to the point where you can't see the Levi label yeah, on it. For sure. Um, those are red to my eye. Yeah. And it's got you can even see the orange tags. I mean, the red, that's red next to orange. So these aren't orange. Yeah. So, Bruce, notice, is, is there yeah, any yeah. way somebody could send a picture of that to the Levi's company and actually see if they could determine what year those by the tag that's, that's on question, the yeah. back? Um, I suppose we could. It's very difficult to, to do that because they, they don't have a lot of records themselves. I initially asked them at the time. Could, could you describe for me what a or send me a photograph of, of a pair of pants from 1995 in the red red and green at that point in time and they didn't even bother getting back to me. But Levi Strauss, by the way, is located someplace in Germany. So right. Um, you know, I might, might be... have a pair from 1995 stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing scuba suits back there. So. <laughs> Yeah, I was young back then, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I probably have a pair from 1995. <laughs> show your age, Denise. Yep, it's from uh, my you know, age. <laughs> the, the, the bottom line on, on that 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 whole issue is that uh, is it possible that the pants that they sent, the evidence that they sent to the coroner, was not the not the evidence that was picked up back in 1999. You know that was that was uh, 
15 years later. So uh, not to say that, uh, that there's something wrong here, not to say that somebody's doing something wrong, but it's, again, another question that needs to be answered. Mm -hmm. uh, Kubi, uh, your friend Kubi in uh, Automobile, a few people are saying that Levi's jeans often have tags on the inside and uh, auto saying multiple tags, a couple tags that, that have the year on them, they say. Well, there was two things that identified them as Levi's. Uh, three well, the, things, actually. The year. Yeah. Well, show the picture and you can see the tag in the back. Well, there was three things that identified them. Uh, and we did find that out. Um, the first one was the tag. Um, the second one was the, the number of belt loops. Um, normally, Levi jeans have, have five belt loops. But in fact, the years the, that these red ones came out with the orange tag, as you can see there, mm -hmm. had seven belt loops. Okay. The third thing that identified them, and you can't see it too well on this picture, but there is that uh, V stitching on the pocket. So those those three things identified them as Levi jeans from the 1990s. Okay. Okay, red Levi jeans from the 1990s. Hmm. I think that's a pretty good piece. I would say that that's a pretty good piece of evidence in my mind, apart from the gas tank. But yeah, don't forget this was found 1999, four years right. after the boys disappeared. Um, so who knows? Hmm. All right. So many questions on this case and so many things that wasn't done. You know, I, 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 my biggest question is because of the Boston Whaler, knowing that it is filled with foam, especially in the front, if what could have happened on this water? You know, if it was very calm that night, there wasn't a storm. You know, what, what could the boys have done in that boat to cause it to capsize them fall out that is confusing to me especially because that boat's supposed to float right right even if the boat was was broken up i mean one of the one of the, the theories was that uh, a freighter came along and ran over the the boat yeah um, someone was asking earlier about if there's a record yeah. of any of the larger ships yeah, well, there was no there was no record of uh, any freighters in that area at that point in time. Um, that was number one. Number two, though, is even if the if the boat did get chewed up by by a freighter freighter, there would have been pieces of uh, styrofoam and everything else floating floating down the down the lake, mm -hmm. and uh, there was never any reports of that either. Mm. Someone's okay. asking about the sonar on the lake. It might be a little a bit late right now. Um, to to be able to find, unless you know, with the with the currents that are, the, and the time frame, whatever is there might have been moved. But more important, but there is a there is a value to doing side scan sonar on certain areas of the lake. There are reports by fishermen and uh, other people who who spend time on that lake of things that they saw in their uh, fish scans fish scanners. Uh, that were never followed up on. Um, there was a, there was a report at one point in time of, of a body being seen floating near the uh, down around the eastern part of of, of the lake, uh, down around the General Motors plant, uh, General Motors head office, I should say, it's down that way. Um, that was never followed up on. There are a lot of things in the reports that were never followed up on by the police. And some of them are hard evidence or hard, hard facts that could be, you know, we could find, for example, the motor, um, because there was there was one that looked a little bit like a motor. Um, so, so there is a value in being able to do the, some side scan sonar, but I really want to do it in a very specific area. Looking for the bodies is, by this point in time, 25 years later, um, would probably not not uh, not work out well. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I'm still right. I'm still hoping that that we are able to find body parts being washed ashore on either the Canadian or American side over the years that have never been reported or never cataloged mm -hmm. and, and compared to this case. 
you know, there was, there was a situation in British Columbia um, on the west coast of Canada in the Fraser River where over a period of time, I believe it was 11 uh, feet with, with uh, shoes that had washed up on shore in that lake. And by doing DNA testing and everything else, uh, they were able to actually identify 10 of the 11 feet. So, oh you know, these, you know, bodies, bodies tend to what they call, what they call de-articulate. Um, you know, the first thing that disappears kind of, and this is kind of, gets a little bit gruesome, but the first thing that, that rolls away, if you want to call it, is, is the head. Because the head is the heaviest part of the body. The, it's being held on by, by, uh, by ligaments and, and, and muscles that have a tendency to, to go over time so the head would fall away but the feet the feet are another thing that actually disarticulate quickly so uh, it's, it's possible that uh, you know we know what the boys were wearing at, at the point in time that they, they were missing you know what kind of shoes they had on um if we could find body parts that had been um, found over the last uh, uh, 25 years it may help us identify or at least come to the conclusion that there was this effect. They were lost in the lake. Mm -hmm. There's there's a group. I don't know uh, if they'd want to take it on because of the age of this being so long ago. But are you familiar with Adventures with Purpose? Yes. Yeah, the divers. I wonder if this is something they consider or if it's too old for them to. Well, I, I, think I don't know their criteria or standards. Yeah. I, I think in their case, it's probably there's probably two reasons why they wouldn't be able to take it on. First of all. They look for they look for hard vehicles primarily. Uh, the second thing is that that they, they look in the small small bodies of water okay. compared compared to the lake. And then the third thing is it's it, it's a long it's an old it's an old case. Old case, yeah. So it, uh, they they wouldn't be in any any better condition than anybody else to do it. Okay. But yeah, in fact, I I sent them a uh, uh, an email. Oh, you did. I didn't, okay. I didn't hear it back from them. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I have spoken to them, so I wouldn't mind sending them something. If they didn't respond to you, I doubt they would bother responding to me. But uh, yeah, um, not, not, nice, nice group of guys for sure. But uh, mm -hmm. it, that that would be my guess is that they probably, for the reasons you named, just the age alone probably would be enough. Never mind the other things on top of yeah. it. Um. All right, guys. So uh, we're we're over the hour mark. So I'm going to start to wind down. Denise, did you have anything that get to answer them? And I want to make sure that uh, Bruce was is able to get at everything he wants to say as well. No, Bruce has actually answered the questions I had. He's been amazing. Uh, with that. He, you People have the, the, uh, 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 Kubi or anyone else. I think you get your pick in the chat, Bruce. They all mm -hmm. love you. So. <laughs> yes, you do, Bruce. Um, no, thank you so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. I know we've chatted in the past and and definitely my goal is to um, do a lot more research on the United States side. I'd love to talk to people who lived around there. So I've been reaching out to people, but, um, you know, maybe there's something we can find to put the pieces together. You know, it takes a team. Yep, yep. Absolutely. It, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been open as, as much as I can with uh, on these particular cases. There's a couple of things that I have to keep back, mm -hmm. um, more for more for slander reasons. <laughs> right. I, I hate going to, well, I don't hate going to court. I kind of like going to court, but for other <laughs> other reasons. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but uh, no, I, you know, the more people know about this thing, uh, the more um, people, you know, come up with ideas, even if they're crazy ideas. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I got to tell you that there have been some very strange ideas put forward, everything from aliens to uh, people being stuffed into barrels, um, you know, just goes on and on and on. And uh, as much as I, I don't believe an awful lot of this kind of stuff, um, I appreciate the fact that some people are putting putting themselves up to to be able to come up mm -hmm. with these ideas. Absolutely, you hear a lot of strange things in a lot of sh cases. Yeah. I mean, you do. There's some of the things people can come up with, but you know, it's it's definitely something you know you kind of think about for a moment. And sometimes it's harmful. Sometimes it's just hilarious. What they yep, <laughs> exactly. 
But no, uh, I greatly appreciate you absolutely coming on the show. Yeah, they absolutely okay. loved you, uh, Bruce. Uh, we did too, of course. Uh, but mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I, I know there's a lot you can't say, a lot uh, you did say. Is there anything that you wanted to get to that we didn't? Uh, I don't want you to feel like you have to rush or if there's something that you feel is important, by all means, get it out. No, no, I, I, I think uh, I think I've given you what I what I want to get out. Um, you know, I have 15, 1600 pages of information and videos and photographs and everything else. Uh, so I, I can't tell you everything, but uh, um, I think you've got a good idea of what, what the situation is. Yeah, you've done a great I, job covering a lot yeah. of basics for the sure. The other thing that I would I would I would say to you though is uh, is a is kind of a warning to to your to your audience, and the warning to your audience is that uh, um, believe everything the police are telling you, but then ask them the questions about everything that they told you, okay? Because quite often they don't know the answers, and sometimes they're making up the answers um, without the knowledge of what the answers could be or should be. Mm -hmm. um, I've you know, I've got a lot of respect for for, uh, for police. Um, I've dealt with them now for close to 30 years um, on different things. and uh, But I also understand that there are limitations to what they can say and what they they can know, okay? Sure. And some Sometimes they make things up. <laughs> so just be mm -hmm. cautious of that. They're human just like us, right? Well, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not a Kobe tell me. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, definitely, this could be something we could follow up on and do. Yeah, I was gonna say, more. I'm sure we could probably do 10 of these that Bruce could fill them up. But mm -hmm. if anything comes that's like an actual real development and, and you want to, and you're looking for outlets to get it out there to really update everyone, by all means, Bruce, we, we'd have you back anytime you want. So just, okay. just let us know. Um, you know, so, sometimes I get people that are looking to do second episodes, but it's like, there really hasn't been any developments, you know? So uh, I try not to, to, to do too many of those, but if there actually is a, a real development that in the case that really uh, makes a huge difference and you want to come on, by all means, just let me know. You have my email and, um, also, I don't know. I think you're on Facebook. If you wanted me to put a link to you on Facebook for people to contact you or anything like that, you can always uh, email that to me and I'll put that in. I didn't ask you beforehand, so I didn't want to link you. I didn't want to, hey, everyone, contact Bruce, and you don't want me to do that, so I wanted to ask you first. But by oh, all means, got, yeah. yeah, there's there's actually three ways. I, I, I've got a Gmail address for, for tip for a tip line. Do you want to uh, give that out? Or? It's, it's just lostboys.tipline at gmail.com. Okay. And then there's, uh, there's two... Um, Two Facebook pages. Uh, one is uh, Lost Boys ninety five, which is the one that's maintained um, for the families, basically. But uh, I mean, there's a lot of there's something in the range of between three and five thousand followers on that page. That that thing. And then I have my own page, which is called um, Seeking Truth Canada um, uh, Facebook page, and that's where I I put an awful lot of the stuff that I I don't just do this case, by the way. I do a lot, a lot of other stuff, okay. including a bunch of military heritage stuff. Uh, so, yeah, and, and I and I put all that there. Um, one thing, uh, the last thing for you um, is that uh, is that I have done this this entire project the last uh, number of years entirely pro bono. I have not charged anybody a single cent for this, so I'm not out there, uh, you know, trying to trying to build up my, my, my bank account on this. I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to find answers to, to questions. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. We appreciate you, Bruce. You, you did amazing. I know the, I know the families appreciate you because if this was my family, I would love having someone like you in our corner, man, out here, mm -hmm. you know, doing actually, as good a job as you do. Actually, you know, for your, for your listeners, I got one other thing, a question to ask them. Okay. If anybody lives in the area of Northern Virginia, okay, can't remember the name of the town, um, Northern Virginia area anyway, there's somebody up there that has a, a tattoo on their right shoulder, I believe it is. It just says the word Cujo, C-U-J-O. Okay. I'm looking for that person. 
You just got to leave it at that. <laughs> I'm looking at that person because one of the missing boys has a tattoo on his right shoulder oh. that says Cujo. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know how many people have Cujo tattooed on their shoulder. But if anybody in your audience ever comes across or knows of someone with a tattoo that says Cujo, C-U-J-O, um, have them get a hold of me. Wow. Okay. That's very interesting. So Watcher says she's in East Tennessee, so not far. Um, all right. Well, this, this will get, I can usually tell by how, you know, how many people visit throughout the live stream, how many it'll get within the first 24 to 48 hours. So we got about between 700 to a thousand people throughout the, uh, throughout this. So probably by tomorrow, I'll have two or 3000 people. So I'd imagine that, um, by tomorrow we'll have some people in the comments. So as you see, there's the chat here. Then there's also the comment section at the bottom. So if you check back tomorrow after a few thousand people have watched it, I can almost guarantee you there'll be one or two people at least that um, will respond to that. So we'll keep an eye okay. on it for you. Yeah. I, you know, keep an eye on it too, but I'll also keep an eye on it too. And if yeah. anyone says, you know, anything in relation to that, I'll, I'll shoot you an email. Okay. Thank you. That's, for interesting. Us. That's a great thing to end with, to give us something to look yes. for. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll end it there. Thank you so much. Okay. Guys, and um, yeah, anyone leave any comments, at, uh, leave any additional comments below for Bruce. So you have his contact information. He was amazing. Thank you so much. Denise was amazing as always. Yeah. So thank you to everyone for joining us. And uh, thanks for watching Jason Eber Live. Click subscribe, set the notification bell to all. And we will see you guys shortly. Thanks again, Denise and Bruce. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. All right, Good take night. care, guys. Bye, guys.